Hey everyone, welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist, Trent Horn. Originally, I was going to host a debate between Tim Gordon from Rules for Retrogrades and a Protestant apologist on an issue related to Sola Scriptura or the canon. Unfortunately, that debate kind of it fell through. Uh, right now, we are working on getting another Protestant opponent for Gordon to debate. So stay tuned for that. We might have someone available for October. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. I mentioned that in my previous episode about uh, Taylor Marshall and other online traditionalists saying I'd really like to see them engage in critical dialogue and debate with non-Catholics. And Gordon stepped up to the plate. And if he's willing to do that, I think that's a good thing. So uh, hopefully we'll do that in October. In the meantime, because the debate uh, didn't happen, I decided to invite my friend and colleague, Mr. Joe Heschmeyer, fellow Catholic Answers apologist, to come back on the show. Really enjoyed having you on earlier, Joe, and we talked about the canon. Thanks. It's good to be on the show. I'm happy to be the uh, the B team. <laughs> you are not the B team. You are you are a part of the A team. Which member of the A team do you want to be? Oh, obviously, Mr. T. I mean, just based on the hair alone. B.A. Baracus? Uh, yeah, exactly. I pitied a fool. What's funny about uh, B.A. Baracus is it's real. It's basically Mr. T. It's just, it, he's not really acting. He's just being Mr. T. Basically, <laughs> we're just like. I mean, look. It, it's kind of like when you have Andre the Giant in the Princess Bride. When you've got someone who seems like maybe they're more prepared for the world of wrestling than the world of of theater or movies, <laughs> you might it, adjust your expectations accordingly. Let's put it that way. In any case, I love it when a plan comes together. Maybe I should have you on for a free for all Friday. We'll just do. Retro television shows. I'm thinking A Team, Knight Rider, Airwolf. Uh, so many good ones to pick from. Yeah, that so. was a good list to come up with off your off the top of your head. I'm impressed. Uh, I am the world's oldest boomer, uh, world's youngest boomer. I've been called on Twitter <laughs> because of my comments about capitalism and things like that. So, in any case, uh, let's get to the topic I wanted to talk about on your show recently. And I'm also I'm really excited to have Joe on because I want you guys to go and subscribe to his podcast, Shameless Popery, not Shameless Potpourri, which would be like some kind of unabashed trivia. Instead, yeah, it's, it's uh, Shameless it's Potpourri. Potent Potables. Potent. potent <laughs> I'll take Potent Potables, Alex. Uh, no, Shameless Potpourri, uh, based on his blog, which is an excellent resource for apologetics. Joe's channel is really thriving, and he's just got really solid content. We talked about the canon of scripture last week. Recently, you have been talking about Mormonism, uh, which is very apropos, by the way, because Matt Fratt at Pints of the Aquinas is trying to put together a debate on Mormonism because he he said something, I'll call it incendiary, <laughs> about, the, uh, about the Book of Mormon and uh, about Mormonism, and some Mormons said they wanted to see a debate on there. So he's, he's trying to do a debate, and then it fell through. So we're all having bad luck with that. Uh, but this is a subject you're interested in as well because you've been uh, covering it a bit on your podcast, right? Yeah, I, I just finished up a, I guess it was five-week series on Mormonism. And I, I don't normally stick with any topic for more than an episode, but it all started off the first of the five episodes. I was suggesting that, broadly speaking, we don't do apologetics as well as we could because we're often uncharitable in it. And I gave mm. the example, and originally it was just meant to be that, kind of an example of uh, doing apologetics with Mormons. Right. That Mormons are often kind of the subject of mockery and scorn, and that's not really the Christian way to approach, even falsehood, not the Christian way to approach people who are in error, that something greater than that is desired. And so then, since I'd kind of thrown the gauntlet down, I spent <laughs> the next four weeks trying to, you know, you can judge for yourself the level of success to figure out, okay, how should we do this better? And what would it look like to, to critically engage with Mormonism in a way that is still charitable and respectful of, of the people who hold those beliefs? I think that's fair because people, well, Catholics want our beliefs to be treated charitably. It reminds me of in the debate that the atheist Sam Harris had with William Lane Craig, and this was back in 2009, on God and morality. And Harris uh, completely decided to abandon the original debate topic and wanted to rip into the Bible, even into Catholicism, trying to say religion's irrational. And he said that, you know, if someone prayed over a bunch of pancakes, and said that was Elvis Presley, you would think they were out of their minds, but Catholics basically do the same thing with the Eucharist. And of course, all Catholics would collectively like, oh, you know, roll their eyes or groan like, oh, come on, give me a break already. But do you think sometimes we we have similar ideas about Mormonism? 
Yeah, I think that's true. And, and look, in saying this, I'm not saying what Mormons believe is all true, but right. that we can approach these things with a, a greater deal of respect. And if like this is not just out of respect for other people. It's also if you're serious about evangelization, because, you know, as a Catholic and, and anyone listening, whatever tradition they're coming from, they've probably experienced someone coming at them with these kind of ridiculous caricatures that are easily kind of batted away. Uh, you gave the example, uh, I think, in last week's episode when you were talking about uh, Kennedy Hall uh, tweeting about Luther and, and passing on some kind of, you know, probably false information. At least unsupported. At the time of the tweet, right. there, was, there was no evidence for it. Like the idea that Luther killed cats as a kid. Or right. And, and so like a Lutheran that. listening to that is going to respond much like a Catholic hearing the pancake thing and just kind of roll their eyes and, and dismiss the person speaking. Right. And as an evangelist, you never want to be in the position where you're saying something so provocatively stupid <laughs> that right. people are just rolling their eyes at you. And, and so when you approach Mormonism with just an air of mockery and dismissal, I think it does two things. One, it undermines your own standing. And two, if the person you're dealing with already has a sense of embattlement or, or a sense of we're a persecuted people, then you've really doubled that kind of uh, sense. You, you've really legitimated right. that feeling. And what that does psychologically and sociologically is it increases group identity. My group is being attacked by outsiders. Right. And so I feel a greater need to, to cling to this group. Right. And, this is true of everybody in every kind of group setting. Uh, you know, it's, it's that famous kind of like, I can criticize my kids, but don't you criticize my kids? You know, <laughs> and, and that kind of thing happens. And so if you have these especially false or, or really uncharitably kind of construed presentations of Mormon theology, mm -hmm. Mormons who know better than you what Mormons believe are, are going to dismiss you. And, and they're going to do it somewhat justifiably because you haven't shown yourself to be a good faith, well-informed uh, kind of participant in the conversation. Right. Like to give an example off the top of my head, I know some people when they've Catholics, when they've talked about Mormonism and said, oh, it's a cult, it's a crazy secret thing with weird like sex rituals that are secret and they have to wear this magic underwear and they talk about it in a very lurid way. But you could say the same thing about at some aspects of Catholicism. You know, we we wear scapulars. The, the Knights of Columbus have uh, secret elements of their rituals. Nothing that's a cult, but they have elements so that the Knights could be something that men could join instead of joining the Masonic Lodge or something like that and still have that sense of, of fraternal uh, fellowship. So do you, do you see, maybe you can unpack that a little bit more that people will make these kinds of accusations about Mormons. Yeah, I think those are, I, like, I purposely steered clear of the whole magic underwear thing because I don't think it moves the ball forward. Right. No one is going to say, aha, I guess the LDS religion is false because you told me that we have magic underwear. You know, like, that is, it's not helping... It's not creating any light. It's only generating heat right. in a way that's likely to, to generate just, like I said, mockery rather than understanding or persuasion. And so in that, like, look, we live in a culture, not just religiously, but politically, where mm -hmm. that's kind of the MO, where half of the point of rhetoric isn't to actually convince anybody else. It's to fire up your own base. Right. And so you can have anti-Mormon or anti-anybody kind of polemics where it, it fires up other Catholics, other Protestants, other whoever, but if it's not actually accurately representing uh, what the other person believes, they're, they're never going to be persuaded by that. And, and when I say it falls short of the Christian standard, I'd use the kind of go to uh, Bible verse on apologetics. You know, apologetics from apologia comes from right. 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16. And we always like to quote the first part, to always be prepared to make a defense in apologia. But if you read the rest of it, what Peter is saying is be prepared to make that defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. So that's the first thing. You should first be living the kind of life that inspires questions about what makes you different. And that's right. probably not you running your mouth on Twitter or, or X, as we now call it. Right. But then Peter goes on to tell you how to do this. He says, do it with gentleness and reverence. And mm -hmm. keep your conscience clear so that when you're abused, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So that's pretty strong language. You know, he has one line about making the defense and several lines telling you, here's how not to do it and here's how right. to do it. And it's almost as if he knew <laughs> people aren't going to have a problem with the I want to argue part. They're going to have a right. problem with having rules of, of doing it well. 
Right. And to talk about the garments also to put a, a, a loop on, you know, put a bow on that, so to speak. Uh, it is something, this is something that Mormons receive as part of their endowment ceremony in the temple. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I should have explained that. No, I, that's fine. Uh, this is what the official LDS handbook says about They're not some kind of like magical garment. Uh, one handbook says this. The garment provides a constant reminder of the covenants made in a temple. When properly worn, it provides protection against temptation and evil. Wearing the garment is also an outward expression of an inward commitment to follow the Savior. So here, this is helpful for us when we're talking to Mormons, that we can identify a lot of common ground with Mormons. This is not too far off from the idea of a sacramental. I mean, look, I, I literally have uh, a bracelet I wear reminding me of Marian consecration. And I can regularly like, you know, tap it or, or even kiss it or, you know, just as a physical kind of reminder. And I think what right. this gets right in both the case of Catholic sacramentals and in the case of, I mean, they, they probably don't use the word sacramentals, but in the case of the endowment undergarments is... Right, like pious objects. Yeah, is that humans aren't just souls trapped in bodies, that there's an actual bodily dimension to who you are and that the relationship between soul and body is a complicated one. There's all sorts of fun kind of secular studies that point to this. You know, uh, they have two groups of people take a test. And the first group of people, they have them put on what they tell them is, is a doctor's lab coat. And that group actually does better on the test than the second group, who's wearing a painter's smock. But the great joke here is it's literally the same white coat. They've yeah. just told them one is a, a doctor's and one is a painter's. There's nothing magical about the item itself, but there's a sort of psychological relationship of mind right. and body. That, that can have a real impact. You literally outperform or underperform on a test based on this. There's all kinds right. of stuff on this. is one of the controversial things in kind of the casual Fridays that workplace productivity can sometimes take a hit when people dress too casually, even at home. That it, psychologically, you're, you have a complicated relationship to your body and to what you wear. All that to say, I think the Mormon thing is totally sound psychologically. Uh, whether it actually provides any spiritual benefit is obviously it's something we could, we could part company on, but it's not just an absurd kind of idea. I'd also say though that the productivity we lose on Casual Friday is offset by the increase in appetizers that are consumed. <laughs> yeah, so touche. I think there there is uh, there's a bit of give and take there. So let's jump into a little bit more about Mormonism. Uh, I do want to say that when when it comes to this sort of dialogue. Finding that common ground is helpful, especially for helping Mormons to consider. If there's any faith they should consider, if they're leaving Mormonism, uh, it should be Catholicism, because we actually have a lot in common. Uh, we both reject sola scriptura. We both believe in the authority of the priesthood, that Jesus gave us a priesthood. Now, Mormons believe the priesthood had to be reestablished in the 19th century, and that'll get into the whole thing about the, you know, the, the great, great apostasy. apostasy which I would definitely want to hear more from you on that. But it does seem like that and baptism and salvation. Do you find it's helpful to be able to focus on this common ground before we get to the meat of the disagreement? I do. I experience this in person. I, a couple that I'm friends with maybe 10, 15 years ago, they lived down the block from the regional headquarters for the LDS in Northern Virginia. And so they just made a habit of having regular dinners with the missionaries mm -hmm. when they'd come in town. And they're both military. They're both very smart. Um, and the wife, Meg, would would always focus on kind of that common ground. And then yeah. Carrie would just kind of like bide his time because he just wanted to talk about like, where do we disagree? Yeah, Meg yeah. just wanted to talk about where do we agree? And the two of them together really mm. effectively kind of did this tag team. I think largely unintentionally just based on their personalities. But yeah. it, it meant that there was an actual buildup of goodwill. And it was clear this was coming from a place of charity. And, and love and respect right. and not a place of just kind of like, gotcha, you know, because it, everyone's experienced that someone just trying to catch you in something and, and tear you down. It's not conducive to changing anyone's mind. So, I mean, the, the missionaries would go and play basketball with Carrie and they even joined us for mass once. And I mean, it really, it was a remarkable scene. Uh, it wasn't like, look, they went out and got, you know, baptized and confirmed in the church. Right. No, but the, it was clear the needle had gotten moved in their understanding of Catholicism Right. And probably their sense of being loved by Catholics. And I think that's really important. You don't have to, you know, like St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you don't have to do all of it. You might just plant the seed. You might water it. You might give it the, you know, but ultimately Christ is the one who gives it the increase. Right. So you do what you can. And I think this is a, a clear example. Like start with where you have common ground because it builds up that mutual respect. Blaise Pascal, 
talks about this, that people are more persuaded uh, by the reasons they come to themselves than by the reasons put into their head by others. So mm. to take a non-Mormon example, uh, with abortion, when somebody tells you, I'm pro-life except in cases of rape, incest, life in the mother, whatever their exceptions are, the temptation is to immediately jump in. And I mean, this is more like you're the you're the expert on this, so I, I know I'm speaking to the choir here. But the temptation is to immediately jump in on where do we disagree and why. Yeah. But it can actually be really helpful to say, well, why aren't you okay with abortion across the board? Right. And then once they tell you whatever that reason is, if there's some recognition that this is an unborn child or that the, whatever's in the womb of the mother has some kind of rights, now you actually have a basis to have a meaningful conversation. If they just say yes and you just say no, that's not likely to go anywhere. But if yeah. you say, I notice you say no most of the time and yes, some of the time, let's focus on our shared no and then see if it sheds light on, on where we disagree. That way you're not running from the controversy, but you are mm -hmm. creating the framework in which it can be productive. Yeah, I've done this as well. When someone says, oh, I'm against abortion in the case of rape, the temptation might be, here's why you are wrong about abortion yes. in the case of rape. But to ask a question, help me understand, why is pregnancy that comes from rape something that is so bad it justifies abortion, but pregnancy from a very another stressful, difficult circumstance doesn't justify abortion? Why are you, why are you against abortion in non-rape cases? And they say, well, because it kills a human being. Well, does that happen in cases of rape as well? And when you ask the question, as you said, quoting Pascal, the person comes to that of their own accord and they right. start to see it. So let's jump then into our disagreements, though, that you've covered on the podcast with Mormonism. I think probably the biggest disagreement, honestly, is the understanding of who God is or how many gods there are. Uh, so, for example, one big difference is that Mormons believe that God is Father. They call him Heavenly Father, just like we believe there is God the Father. But they believe that God the Father is, we now we believe God the Son is embodied after the incarnation, mm -hmm. and he will always have a human nature for the rest of time. Right. The Word but, became flesh. Right. And that's John permanent. 14. Yeah, he because he doesn't change. It's not like Jesus is going to go back to being disembodied. He will right. always have a human nature. But they also believe that God the Father has a body and that he is a a man or at least or he was a man like you or I that's a little bit of a different doctrine but they would say that god has a the father has a physical body and some christians might scoff at that and say oh that's just so silly how could you believe something like that and yet when you read scripture especially the old testament there's a lot of verses that you you can take anthropomorphically god's right hand uh, right. Moses seeing the face of God and God's backside. So it's not too far off. Someone could read that and say, yeah, I think God has a body. It seems pretty similar here in scripture. Yeah. I mean, in Exodus, we even hear about the wings of God and Psalms, the same thing. So right. it, it raises a bunch of questions about what kind of body are we talking about here? And I think right. most people, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, we would read that and say, this seems to be metaphorical language. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. it isn't as if the Mormons have have nothing to point to. They can point to plenty of passages that right. taken literally uh, would suggest that God the Father has a body. Mm -hmm. And now they, this, of course, raises a second question. When we see these depictions of God, who are we talking about there? Because Mormons don't believe in the Trinity as, as classically understood. They believe that the Father and the Son both have bodies and the Spirit is a personage of spirit, but that they're not literally one in being that they, they aren't consubstantial. They're, they're three separate beings on, on a common mission. This is sometimes called social Trinitarianism or, or sometimes just Yeah, they're, they're, they're one in perfect cooperation, but they're really three distinct beings. And so listening to Mormon theologians on this, it sounds like at any given time they could leave that union with each other, but they wouldn't because it's better than, than not being united. Right. But it's certainly a different vision of the Godhead then, you know, the, the fourth ladder in council talking about the father pouring out everything that is God into the son and the son receiving this and responding and the fruit of that being the Holy Spirit, that that's a very different image of the Godhead. Even though we're using the same words, we're really conceptualizing this very differently. And that's important, I think, for both sides to realize. Because I think there's actually a, a good deal of mutual misunderstanding. If you've only grown up with one of those two visions of God, the other one can sound strange and, and pagan, frankly, in, in both directions. And I, I've, mm -hmm. I've heard that charge of paganism 
thrown in right. both directions. Right. And and I would point out also to listeners, like when you read things in scripture uh, that could be taken literally, it's, it says things like, you know, Moses spoke to God face to face as a man does with his friend. It doesn't mean he saw God the Father in a literal face because, you know, a blind person can speak to you face to face. It's a language is talking about the intimacy right. that Moses has with God or God in uh, revealing himself. He's using uh, this kind of language that human beings can understand. But if God created everything from nothing, including all of space, time, matter, and energy, well, then God cannot be composed of matter because he, if he were made of matter, he'd have to belong in pre-existing space, which he created from nothing, which brings us to another big difference between Catholics and Mormons because Mormons also deny the doctrine of creation from nothing. They exactly. would say, no, everything has is existed eternally. Um, in fact, Doctrine and Covenants, one of the Mormon scriptures in 9329, says, man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence, or the light of truth, was not created or made. Indeed, can, uh, neither indeed can be. So the idea is that the cosmos, our spirits, they're all just kind of out there. And in Mormonism, to borrow a line from St. Athanasius, in Mormonism, God is not creator, he is craftsman. Isn't yeah, it? if you're familiar with the concept of the demiurge, you know, very much mm -hmm. that kind of conceptualization of God. Mm -hmm. Right, so do you think that's also something important for us to focus on uh, when we're talking about God and his relationship to creatures? That Because this is also brings another big point, and this can be a sticking point. You can help us walk through this. That Mormons can often be very offended when people say they are not Christians. Right. You know, it's uh, it's like how dare you say that? It it reminds me of I think it might have been Bertrand Russell who who said that, or maybe it was Christopher Hitchens, some smart British guy, some some smart British atheist who said uh, that some people equ equate maybe it was Lewis, another smart British guy, that people equate. Christian with just being a nice chap. And if you deny somebody as Christian, it's like you're saying they're a mean or a, or a bad person. But we have a very specific theological point yeah, that's, that that's we're Lewis, making. Because he, he points out that gentlemen underwent this same transformation, that once upon a time, gentlemen meant something very specific. Yeah. It meant that you were part of the landed elite. So you could be a jerk and be a gentleman. You could be a great guy and not be a gentleman. Oh, right? but yeah. Gentleman just became a, a term for like, nice. And we didn't need that word. We already had it. And, right. and so... Now there's not really a clear term for someone who is literally a gentleman because mm -hmm. unless you or make it really clear from context, it sounds like you're just praising them. And he points right. out that Christian has undergone the same thing, that Christian historically means something very specific, but we can say, oh, that's very Christian of him. And, and right. we mean something much vaguer where it, it might not even be applied to a confessing Christian. And I think some right. of that is more the British usage of the term than the modern American usage but I think it's, it's certainly a true thing. So when you say they're not Christian, it sounds like you're not making a creedal point. It sounds like you're making a, a moral value judgment to just say they're bad people. Yeah, are so they engage, actually, or they engage in un-Christ-like behavior, which right, many Mormons, right. that's certainly not the case. Yeah, and so this is something where I think in general, debating the labels is unhelpful. You know, saying, well, is so-and-so really a feminist or really a Republican or really a Democrat? Those debates... They happen all the time. They get people really worked up. And they seem to me to be a tremendous waste of time. Debate mm -hmm. the actual idea that this person is known for. And don't debate whether they're really, you know, a, a true member of the party or not. That's just not the relevant question. And so, you know, if, if it's false or if it's incompatible with Christianity or with Catholicism or whatever, then by all means, point that out. But don't just make the, you're not really a Catholic claim. Make the stronger claim of what you believe contradicts this thing the Catholic Church teaches or contradicts this thing that is, you know, something all Christians must hold to. You can make that distinction, but that right. requires you to actually do a good deal more work. So I tried to show in, in the podcast approach mm -hmm. that you don't have to say Mormons aren't Christian. You can just say Mormons deny the Trinity. Right. If you say Mormons aren't Christian, you have a big fight over labels. If you say mm. Mormons deny the Trinity, they'll agree, they would agree you with move you. Forward. They would agree with you on that, right? Because they, 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 they acknowledge that they don't believe in the Trinity. Yeah, I mean, even um, uh, Joseph Smith uh, argued against the Trinity. Uh, he once put it this way: He said, Joseph Smith, by the way, uh, being the the founding alleged prophet of Mormonism, author 
alleged translator of the Book of Mormon, saying of the Trinity, three in one and one in three. It is a curious organization. All are to be crammed into one God, according to sectarianism. It would make the biggest God in all the world. He would be a wonderfully big God. He would be a giant or a monster. I sort of miss 19th century criticisms of things. Yes. They had a certain wonderful whimsy and snootiness about them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is remarkable. And Now, I, I got in some trouble for quoting Brigham Young, his successor, of, mm-hmm. of saying that the Methodist God is the Mormon devil because he has a body. And, and some Mormons were offended by that. But I was like, look, I'm, I'm literally just quoting a guy you regard as a prophet, explaining the difference between right. the Mormon and the Christian or you know Protestant Catholic understanding uh, of the Godhead. So it, it, right. it is difficult. I mean, it's difficult to have a constructive conversation here because understandably people's feelings get hurt if you say, I, I don't regard what you're talking about as, as Christianity. And the same way that I think we would kind of grimace at the term sectarian to describe Catholics right. or... Or even for that matter, Orthodox. Yeah. So, you know, people who can plausibly claim to go back to the apostles to, to right. say it's a sect is is a really dismissive kind of label, and, and intentionally so. Why don't you break down a little bit of how Mormons disagree with, with Christians, or at least how Mormon anti-Trinitarianism differs from classical Trinitarianism? I will yeah. note, though, that in, in dialoguing about Mormonism and the arguments when these things come up, it ends up posing a few problems for Protestants. Uh, we won't get into it in this episode, actually, but I'm going to encourage people to go to your channel to talk to talk about the great apostasy. You have an episode, I'm sure, just on that, right? I do, because uh, I can give a two-sentence version if you want. Go right ahead. Uh, many Protestants argued that the church fell into a total apostasy, that Christ established a church on earth and it got wiped out. Mormons argue, if that's the case, a monk like Luther or a lawyer like Calvin wouldn't be sufficient to restore it. A true restoration would need a prophet, and guess what? We've got one. Right. And so there's a, actually a tremendous amount of agreement between Catholics and Mormons in terms of what the stakes are. That it, you know, to say that the entire church fell into apostasy is a really serious claim, and it would seemingly create a position that's impossible for Protestantism. Now. Some Protestants don't hold their great apostasy. That was more than two sentences, but, but no, I, the, I the understand what you what you mean is that, and some Protestants will try to argue against Mormons that there was no great apostasy, to which Mormons will counter, "Fine, then where is this authoritative hierarchical church right. that we see in the New Testament that's apostolic? Then where is it?" So yes, so you and they'll even in- ask specifically about the priesthood and about the keys, which is like, hey, you're asking exactly the right questions. And so in that sense, I, I think Catholics and Mormons, we're, we're often focusing on the same passages and on the same kind of concepts and saying, right. okay, this seems to be a really important thing. When Jesus says, I will build my church, he seems to really mean something bigger than some people are going to follow me. Mm-hmm. There seems to be something structured and organized and visible about that. So what happened? Right. And so that's where another point I want to bring over the Trinity is that for Protestants, they'll say, well, look, Scripture is sufficient to equip the man of God for every good work, 2 Timothy 3.17. And one of my replies is, does Scripture define who is a Christian and who is not? Uh, Because Protestants will make a case and be challenged by anti-Trinitarians and engage in these, you know, in debates. You know, you'll have people like Dale Tuggy, very, very smart guy. Maybe one day I'll debate him on the Trinity, but he's a smart guy. He's debated uh, different people. I think Michael Brown is one. Uh, Not necessarily as the Trinity, but... Uh, they'll debate about whether the Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. So if the fact that Protestants will debate that with non-Christians, does the Bible teach the Trinity or not? The Bible then certainly does not teach the proposition, in order to be a Christian, you must believe in the Trinity. That's certainly not explicit in Scripture. And Protestants might have to admit, yeah, I guess it's not in Scripture, so Scripture can't tell us whether you need to believe that or not. But that seems absurd to me, that if the Bible is the sole infallible rule of faith of the church, wouldn't it tell us what you must believe and what you can't believe in order to be a Christian? And you can't really get that. More, the traditional definition of a Christian was, do you have a valid baptism? And it was the church that determined which of the heretical sects had valid baptisms and which ones did not. Yeah, exactly. You could be, it's just like you could be a bad gentleman. You could be a bad Christian. Right, exactly. And, and you could be someone who was trying to follow Christ but you weren't an actual baptized Christian. But that actually meant something very specific, very explicit, very, you could see it and determine it. 
it wasn't just a value judgment one person is making on on another. Because once you put it in that category, if are you Christian means something like, are you a good person? I've got no right to make that judgment about anybody right. else. And so that puts it in a really dangerous category where we can't say what is and isn't Christian. Right. I was watching. So uh, let's break down uh, then the oh, yeah. anti. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I, I was right watching ahead. a and a with R.C. Sproul and uh, John MacArthur. And someone asked, you know, my whole family is Catholic and they pray to saints. Are they going to hell? And uh, Sproul said, probably, but hopefully not. And then uh, one of the two, I think it was, I think it was Sproul, said, everybody gets theology wrong, but some errors are graver than others. And it seemed to me that the question this was raising was a huge one. Like, who determines which errors are so grave? You know, right. if, if everybody's theology falls short on some points, as he's believing, he doesn't believe in an infallible church, and, and nobody believes that every individual is infallible. Well, then, how, what level of error is acceptable where we can just live with each right. other? Because the question is not, is the Trinity true? It's, is the Trinity of the level that everyone must agree on that in order to be a Christian. And I, th I think the church has historically said yes, for reasons of baptism, that in Acts 2, the way you join the church is through baptism. When they say, what, what must we do to be saved? Peter tells them to repent and be baptized. And then this is a formula for salvation, Mark 16, 16. And so in that sense, you can say the Trinity is really crucial because of its sacramental role. But if you reject sacramental baptism and think of baptism just as an ordinance, Right. It becomes much harder to, I think, make that case. Right. So it's interesting, though, that the difference in theology and where it goes really completely off the off the reservation or not. Uh, with Mormonism, there's an interesting quote in a 2001 article in the Vatican newspaper, L'Osservatore Romano. Father Luis Ladaria uh, was writing in there about whether Mormon baptisms are valid, because we believe that Orthodox and most Protestant baptisms are right. valid. But Mormon baptisms are not valid, even though they use the same formula, the Father, yes, Son, and Holy really Spirit. Yes, this is really striking. So Father Ladaria said this, one cannot even consider that this doctrine, Mormon doctrine, is a heresy. The teaching of the Mormons has a completely different matrix. So it's something so far, if it's not just a heresy, uh, it is right. something that has completely gone beyond in the what, same way that you would, you would not is. describe Islam as a Christian heresy, even though it claims some kind of relationship to the Old Testament and the New Testament and, right. and to the person of Jesus Christ. There is some sense in which there's a following of Jesus, but something greater than that is necessary for it to even be in the realm of a Christian mm -hmm. heresy. So what do you think about Mormonism, especially about the Trinity, that warrants this kinds of description? Yeah, well, again, you know, the the idea that it's three gods who are one Godhead, uh, puts it in a different category. Judaism is fiercely monotheistic. Christianity is the fruit of Judaism. And so in as much as you have something purporting to be Christian, you know, not just a Christian denomination, but the Church of Jesus Christ restored, uh, mm. teaching something that, that doesn't fit with the Shema Israel, the you know, listen, O Israel, the, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, that notion of the oneness of God Right. It is really built into the whole thing, and it is critical. It is the distinguishing factor um, between Israel and all of its neighbors, that Israel believes there's one God, and, and all the Canaanites are, are polytheists. And so this is something that just gets driven home again and again and again and again. And so if it's that important, if th it's this kind of make or break, where it's the kind of overarching narrative in the Old Testament of this backsliding into idolatry, into the worship of other gods who aren't really gods. Right. To, to go back on all of that and say, actually, there's three gods, which is, I understand this is what people think the Trinity is is saying, but it's not. Right. Now, and I think so that— That's where some, some actual sophistication is required. Right. And so I, I think one of the problems here is, is that I would almost say that uh, both Islam and Mormonism are non-Christian religions, but I would say that Islam is closer to a Christian worldview than Mormonism at least to a classical Christian worldview, because Islam still affirms the existence of one infinite God. It affirms monotheism 
uh, fanatically. Uh, and to their credit, yeah, that's it good. It is fiercely monotheistic. And in, in the way Judaism and Christianity would say, yes, you're right to affirm that. Amen. That, I mean, that and is it correct. leads to the other extreme of denying the Trinity right. because they think we have too many persons, where the, the and, Mormon response is, no, you got the right number of persons, but not enough beings. <laughs> and, and so it's the three and one, one side disagrees with the three, one side disagrees with the one. But it, that is the, the critical kind of question. But notice another area that there's actually a difference between Islam and Mormonism. Islam and Mormonism have a fascinating number of similarities. Yeah. Uh, and although I find both Muslims and Mormons get kind of annoyed by, by anyone pointing that out. Sure. But one difference is, is, as you say, there's a real notion, not just of there being one God, but of God, the creator of everything. Right. And there's a belief in creation from nothing in some sense. And so, you know, the atheist apologetics we could answer them from a Catholic perspective in much the same way you could answer them from a Muslim perspective. I mean, right. even the, the history of the Kalam argument it pretty famously is, is largely a Muslim argument that, that Christians adopt. And so the apologetics dimension, the strange place Mormons find themselves is that they frequently, like the depiction of God as kind of a, a demiurge, makes it fall victim to many of the new atheist arguments. As David Bentley Hart points out, uh, there's not any reason to believe in a demiurge any more or less than the flying spaghetti monster because they're the same type of being. They're just a powerful thing out there in the universe somewhere. Right. So and it falls think, victim we, to a lot of the atheist arguments, but it also falls victim to a lot of the Christian argu or the theistic arguments against atheism, that you can't right. have an infinite regress. And so if the argument, and here, I want to be really clear, not all Mormons believe that God the Father has his own God. Right. Well, that is certainly what Joseph Smith taught. It's certainly what Brigham Young taught. Right. Uh, and so there is this notion of an infinite regress of gods that the reason God the Father has a body is because he used to live on a different planet and had his own God. And, and seemingly his God was also an exalted man. And so it, it creates this logical kind of infinite regress. And so it, it's a strange position to fall into where both theists and atheists would say, Philosophically, that worldview doesn't make sense, and, and kind of here's why. And there was a recent uh, Mormon statement on this that talked about, he'll say, oh, Mormons don't believe that we get our own planet when we die. Well, the statement, it said, while few Latter-day Saints would identify with caricatures of having their own planet, most would agree that the awe inspired by creation hints at our creative potential in the eternities. And here's where I think it gets to probably the biggest difference of why Mormonism, Father Ladaria calls it, belonging to a completely different matrix. In Christianity and Islam, the difference between man and God is one of kind with an yes. infinite separation. Uh, so creator and creature are separated by an, an infinite gulf that man can never can never cross uh, fully. Let me I'll qualify that in a second. Uh, however, in Mormonism, the difference between man and God is one of degree. Yeah, uh, and, and one in some ways of time. That, yeah. that God is just, you know, like being a, a senior when someone else is a freshman. <laughs> the seniors right. look giant and magnificent, but you know in time you'll get there yourself. Because so in 1909, the Mormon First Presidency, it said this, because it talks about Jesus being our elder brother in Mormonism, mm -hmm. and what they mean. So Jesus is not, fa the Father and Jesus and the Spirit are not divine beings different in kind from us. So the Father's uh, begetting of the Son is hardly any different from how he would beget the, the creation of the rest of us, because in Mormonism, all human beings are embodied intelligences that have existed for all eternity. So in 1909, the Mormon First Presidency said this, the Father of Jesus is our Father also. Jesus, however, is the firstborn among all the sons of God, the first begotten in the Spirit, and the only begotten in the flesh. He is our elder brother, and we, like him, are in the image of God. Uh, we, and we also have the idea that along with Heavenly Father, there is a, a Heavenly Mother through which mm -hmm. uh, we are all begotten. So there's just this difference in degree rather than kind. Now, of course, we talk about us being divinized. You know, we become holier like God. We, be, you know, we, we can have those qualities, but we will never become omnipotent or omniscient. But in Mormonism, mm, yes. that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, I mean, what, what I think might be the case is really that when they speak of divine omnipotence and omniscience, they don't mean that literally. Yeah, it's seemingly. not classical. Yeah, yeah, their right. God is like, still very, very limited. There, there are a lot of limitations on, on God. So even if they can talk about divine omnipotence, it's certainly, so this, I, I'm 
going to, again, flag, this is something that is not the official church teaching, but Brigham Young, the second prophet, right. describes the creation of the cosmos and that the father and the son, so he thinks that Adam is, is ultimately our God. And, and we'll, that's the Adam God doctrine is not believed by the LDS today, right. but that's not really the, but in that sermon, it, it's striking because he talks about them kind of waiting for the cosmos to shift with like an earthquake so they can have space to create a universe. And so it's really telling there that it's, it's like they have a, a nanosecond in which to do it. Uh, that is not omnipotence. If, if you're right. waiting around for a train because, you know, or waiting around for a divine or, you know, a, a cosmological earthquake. So you right. have space to create a universe. Whatever that is, is not what everybody else means by omnipotence. And so that's another one of those words to kind of flag. I, I pointed to the kind of atheist connection. I know you've done a video on this. Yeah. In as much as the LDS believe that even spirit is material in some way, uh, although it's not really defined what that means or how. Right. The idea that there's a powerful spiritual being, excuse me, a powerful material being that's just like bigger and stronger than us that didn't create the cosmos, but can create things in the cosmos out of pre-existing matter. An atheist could affirm all of that. They would just say it's an alien rather than, they, you know, there would be a difference of label. They would say alien rather than God. But it wouldn't be contrary to an atheistic worldview that, you know, you've got an infinitely old material cosmos. Matter is all that exists. There is no higher, you know, all of that stuff seemingly is there. Now, you have something like an immaterial intelligence, which is probably going to be the thing that distinguishes Mormonism from atheism. But well, I think that the term we could use here would be naturalism. And so yes. the idea is that if you say you're a naturalist, what does that mean? Oh, well, only nature exists. Right. Now, there are naturalists who believe that we have immaterial minds that are ultimately dependent on physical matter, for example. Right. So what is interesting is that you could be a naturalistic philosopher and believe only the natural world exists, but that in, in the natural world, there are just these beings with greater levels of power than others. Though for me, as a critic of naturalism, I would say that even though that's a richer view of naturalism, it ultimately is just as unexplained as more minimal forms of naturalism that just have mundane things like atoms and nothing else super special going Precisely. on. Precisely. That's what I meant when I said like a lot of the criticisms of atheism right. are also the logical shortcomings seemingly with, with an LDS theology. I also appreciated that you brought up about Brigham Young and Joseph Smith this is important for us when we're, and maybe we can close on this. I'll give you an opportunity if anything else you want to throw out. But I just want to say, I appreciate you saying, this isn't what Mormonism teaches. Uh, this is the opinion of, of Brigham Young or Smith, that many critics who criticize Catholicism will point to a church father, or they'll point to something in the Catechism of the Council interview. of Trent, yeah. papal airplane interview, uh, even older documents, and say, yeah. ah, or the writings of the fathers, or, or imagery that's used at a council, or a disciplinary canon, and say, oh yes, well, the, the Catholic Church currently teaches this right now, de fide, to say, no, 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 the, what we teach has different levels of authority right. and understanding, and, and Mormonism is similar, so we have to take that care when we're sorting out what Mormon doctrine is and what it isn't. And this is actually an area in which I have a, a good deal of appreciation for the LDS really clarify. This mm. is how we know when something is a doctrine. But nevertheless, if you're a non-Mormon, probably your best bet is to not go in guns blazing saying, you believe X, Y, Z, uh, but to really start off saying, I've read that Joseph Smith taught X, Y, Z. Is that something you believe it? Right. Uh, you know, and, and put it as a question. Find out, is, is this something that's church teaching or is this something that you know, because not every word that came from his mouth is considered scripture. Fair enough, right? Like St. Peter right. can be rebuked by St. Paul in Galatians 2. There's right. no contradiction between believing that and believing in, in the inspiration of First and Second Peter or believing in people right. infallibility. So, you know, we don't have any principled objection to any of that, but it can be helpful in terms of the dialogue to, to really hammer those things out because this is an area where what Mormons claimed their church taught maybe 100 years ago was much broader, and it, it's been mm -hmm. kind of, I would argue, maybe pared down. And so that can be really, even if you're reading like an older source that says the LDS church, you know, the, the Mormon church teaches this, the LDS church teaches that, you should, you should still probably check before you just kind of declare that to be true. Right. 
Very good. All right. Is there um, anything else from the series you wanted to touch on? Otherwise, I w- there's so much good content. We only scratched the surface of it. I'm going to post some links below for, so people can check it out at Shameless Popery. But yeah, just another else? scripture, maybe as sure. encouragement. In yes. Ephesians 4, uh, chapter 14, St. Paul warns us not to be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the cunning of men, by their craftiness and deceitful wiles. And so it's a very strong kind of admonition to avoid false doctrine. He mm-hmm. doesn't pull his punches. But in the next verse, he tells us what the solution to that is, which is speaking the truth in love. And so the two ways we fall short of that are being jerks, but we're not speaking the truth in love. We're speaking right. it in, in contempt or in hate or whatever, or by thinking it's unloving to tell the truth. And so then we just avoid the truth out of a false yeah. sense of love. We want to avoid both of those extremes. Mm-hmm. And it's much harder, and you might have to apologize more, to do your best to you know humbly, reverently, gently say, it sounds like you're saying X, and if that's what you're saying... Here's why I disagree, and, and, and right. you know, here are all the arguments against it. Perfect. Joe Heschmeyer, Shameless Popery. Check out the links below. Uh, he's got a wonderful YouTube channel that is growing. Want to see more content from there. Uh, and thank you guys so much for listening. If you want to help us grow, we're getting close to 100,000 subscribers, everyone. We're just a few thousand away. So if you could subscribe to our channel, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trendhornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.